Hello, you're listening to 101 Part-Time Jobs, the podcast where I usually speak to musicians and artists about the jobs they've had between going on tours, between tours or making records or before they started their group. But today's a little bit different in that I wanted to learn more about a group that's really fascinating me. I wanted to know about how the group formed and the way that they're referencing songs from centuries ago to continue the lineage of those songs and tell narratives, stories through song and traditional folk and create something that's exciting and interesting. Last year, their compilation album, Songs Without Authors, Volume 1, came out a supreme listen. And not too long ago, they released a new single, Barbary Allen, the song playing beneath this, which goes as far back as the 17th century. So loads to read about this, loads to dig into and get into. And, and I love the imagery, the way that these songs continue to evolve and the way Broadside Hacks are pushing that forward. Cheers for listening to 101 Part-Time Jobs. This episode is supported by 2000 Trees Festival, taking place from the 6th to the 9th of July in Cheltenham, just a few hours away from London. Idols, Jimmy Eat World, Thrice and Turnstile are all headlining. They were the winner of the Best Medium Sized Festival, once at the UK Festival Awards. And if you know you want to go but haven't yet got your ticket, you can get 10% off with the voucher code 101POD. 2000treesfestival.co.uk is the website and 101POD is the promo code that's 10% off which saves you 20 quid and you can go see bands like Berries, Calva Louise, The Regrets, Gaz Brookfield, Petrol Girls, loads of bands if you're into heavy guitar music. That's 2000treesfestival.co.uk, 101POD is the promo code, save yourself 20 quid on a good time. Cheers for listening, this is Campbell Baum from Broadside Hacks. Go well. I guess we've all, I mean, for one, I guess we're all very new to, to playing folk music. I mean, there's maybe the odd person that is, is kind of, it's in his, uh, he's kind of been raised on it. But most, I think the most of us are still sort of, it's very new to us. And I guess we've all, uh, it's kind of the first time it's quite nice it's nice because it's the first time that we're not only is it the first time we're playing together as a group but it's the first time that we're discovering how to sort of play it you know and we're all kind of coming from mm. at starting at the same level and kind of learning together which is nice you know as opposed to it being you know I guess we're all kind of mid-20s or whatever usually by this point you'd think okay everyone's been in a band they've kind of been writing their own songs or whatever and you kind of by this point, it would probably be maybe the second or third band that you've been in. Whereas for us doing this, it feels like we're kind of starting again, I guess, starting from scratch. Moving into a, a new folk world, you're playing Kite Festival, which lineup is amazing. Shirley Collins. I mean, that's sort of on my mind 24 <laughs> seven about how ways that we can kind of pull that off the best, you know, the best we can. Because <laughs> it's, it's kind of, I'm not sure when we got offered actually my... Jeff Barrett from Heavenly actually booked us for it. Um, it wasn't announced or anything because it's the first year, isn't it? And Jeff just called called me up and uh, said, "I saw you saw you um, perform the other night, and I've got this idea. Shirley's, we've got the Heavenly stage at Kite Festival, and Shirley's launching this book." He said, "Do you know who Alan Lomax is?" And I was like, "I was reading reading Alan Lomax, uh, the man who recorded the world, which is like a book on his life." Uh, at that point so I was like I do know him um, <laughs> obviously reading a book like that it feels like miles and miles worlds of worlds away and then suddenly you know reading about Alan and Shirley collecting these songs in the 50s and then suddenly there's um, Jeff saying do you fancy performing on stage with Shirley play performing these songs and it was like this crazy yeah really weird but amazing yeah I called up one of the other other guys in the band and he said that he was like, where does it go from there? That's kind of like, as a folk musician, that's like the peak. <laughs> like, you know, uh, which it kind of, which is why it's so it's kind of scary, but also obviously a real privilege. Has that kind of exploded your imagination in terms of, you know, the way you think about playing music, but also the kind of aspirations, I suppose, if that's not too much of a, like a, a blunt thing to say i mean yeah i think i guess um this whole thing was kind of born out of their all aspirations being kind of squashed by covid 
um in lockdown so that was kind of it was kind of like well okay doing playing in this project playing in sorry whatever but where's no one knows where that's going so it's kind of it was definitely i think the whole sort of it started um because there were no aspirations you know there was no no one knew exactly what was going to happen in the next mm. year or so so um so it came just from looking for another kind of looking I guess yeah looking for another uh, avenue into something new into like looking um to sort of um delve into something that was like so outside of my sort of comfort zone I guess and and trying to incorporate that into I was never kind of stepping fully away from what I sort of inherently do I don't think it was never I was never like right I'm starting completely new you know I kind of everything up to that point I guess had still influences how playing in sort of you know other bands indie bands or whatever kind of influences still how you you know how I kind of look at approach these songs and approach arranging them because um at the end of the day it's it's all kind of I don't kind of um say if I'm arranging you know like an, an old song I don't um limit myself to it being like one thing you know because it's that genre or whatever it's kind of all kind of everything just filters into one another you know it's just the source is different instead of coming unless instead of like starting from um something that you've like some chords that you've written on a guitar it's like you're starting from somewhere else you're taking finding a field recording and then starting from there and then putting chords to that and you know instead is that liberating you know doing this thing that you've done for so long uh you're fi finding that different well of inspiration that different source definitely yeah i mean um yeah it's nice to it's kind of it, now it seems right at this very moment kind of um uh, it's or for the last since covid since the pandemic started it's been kind of my main i guess my main sort of focus so that's been the main thing and then obviously this next we've got the next sorry um all that all, next sorry album and stuff and all that's going to kick off soon so who knows where but it's definitely been liberating for this period i think i mean it's i'm not sure I mean, I'm sure I would have found something else to do, but it's definitely, it's been nice to have something to focus on for sure. And it's got to be said, you know, folk music, the audience of all ages, more cultures. And and that, that seems really exciting. Definitely. Yeah. I think that was kind of evident when we did, we did the songs with our authors tour in back in September. Um, and I honestly, to be honest, I mean, we kind of, with our agent and stuff, we made this plan to, to do this tour because there was an album coming out and it was like felt you know stuff was a bit more relaxed and um and this was sort of came up with this plan to do this sort of you know relatively ambitious tour um considering that it wasn't no one really knew what broadside hacks was they weren't didn't know if it was a band they thought it was like the label but then they weren't sure <laughs> you know and we were saying there was no music credited to broadside hacks online and then there was this tour doing performing as broadside hacks so it was kind of i was like i don't know i can't really i remember on the first date being in cardiff and being like i wonder who's gonna come to this <laughs> because it was not really it was not clear you know there was like obviously all these people performing like katie or naima or whatever performing and you were like are, are people that are into you know katie's music gonna come or um or is it gonna be more is it gonna be all sort of older folk who are into trad music and it was in the end it kind of was a bit of a mix but yeah no it is definitely nice so there's um i feel like if you are into traditional music you're when a band comes to town or whatever and it's doing you know you're gonna go and you're probably gonna hear something that is familiar to you now so it's, it's slightly more comforting i guess than going to see um see a band who's like you know writing original songs and they you don't know any of them you know did you find many people were were coming because of the affiliated members or, or the the groups of the members in broadside hacks could you see people having a bit of a gateway for that yeah i think so um i guess it's not i think definitely london shows i mean uh, the london shows have been mainly people that you know were we were associated with anyway and who are in, in or or sort of affiliated within the scene or whatever um and i think that's nice i mean it 
it doesn't feel weird for some reason. I mean, you know, somewhere like the windmill or whatever, you, you can you can get away with doing anything there. It's, you know, just because it's you come and you're playing traditional a uh, hundred years old songs, it's people kind of people are used to seeing stuff that they have never seen in that space, you know. Uh much cry much much crazier stuff than than what we do. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's felt like a nice people have people were kind of have, have felt pretty responsive to it, definitely in London. You're saying how, you know, you you're already getting into Shirley Collins and and discovering your own interest in that. Have you really done like a swan dive into discovering these these folk? Yeah, I mean, I guess the main definitely into into the hist- I mean, it kind of it started when I the this um songs with that authors thing kind of started which i guess was the idea was like july 2020 or whatever when it first sort of thought of the idea um and that was when i guess that was more about i guess it was it was kind of it was just taking it was just trying and ex- um it was like an exercise really taking like try arranging a piece of music which kind of already exists you're not it's not coming you're not coming up with the whole thing, you know, you've kind of got to work with something that is already there. Um, that was, I guess, when I started delving into, into stuff and definitely we did, I did a booklet with the, with the album as well, which um, I kind of thought I really wanted something because it meant a lot to, or it was one of the things that I was really, I really got me hooked on it was all of the histories and all the different versions of the songs and uh, the variations and how they've sort of, um, how they've traveled and and changed and been adapted or whatever and i felt it was important to have that information um alongside the album so yeah we did this booklet and i thought it would be i wanted something visual because all of the all of the sort of um inserts or whatever that i have with you know the albums that i have are all just pages and pages of text and it's certainly someone that doesn't know about um I don't know it's just no one it's never that appealing you know to read when you just when you're opening something and it's just like pages and pages of you know text so we did this um this good design I was working with um we came up with this idea to have a map and then have pinpoints on the map of of like the first place the first recorded reference of the song a list of um, the first, all of the sort of recording, other v- recordings of the songs up until now, whatever, and you'd have a visual thing so you could see how it had travelled, where around the world it had gone and Great. stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I've been kind of, and that, doing the research for that was like scrolling through like Reddit threads and stuff and like basically digging into the the, the hot, dark, darkest corners of the um, internet trying to find out like, where the songs had originated from if there was no you know if if there wasn't anything on wikipedia or whatever so what were like some of the 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 most interesting or captivating places or people or cultures or feelings that that you discovered there there was one that james yorkston arranged which was this old gaelic song um i he he did say where he found it but there was other than that there was other than that one recording there was zero information on it so that involved like finding ordering a couple of books and then like doing some research and finding out some more stuff from there and but the ones that are really old you know those ones that go back those old the ones that go back to you know like 16th century or whatever are interesting because there's some of them there they might have, they've got like accredited author who's someone else disagrees um, with the source and says no this person wrote it and then someone goes oh this person actually didn't exist it was a um yeah I don't know it's funny there's um there's a bit of that in there as well it makes me think I don't you know did you go to uni I didn't know actually I spent none of my time reading books it does make you think of all the years that you didn't spend you know doing some some research into something that's really mm. kind of captivating or stimulating mm. for sure yeah I mean um I certainly yeah, this is, it had been a while since I'd kind of put my mind to to something like this or just gone back, you know, to dug that much into sort of history, you know, um, I guess, because, yeah, as I said, I didn't go to uni, but 
I it was nice because it was kind of it was this accompanying thing to something that was sort of something that I knew and it just kind of it was it all kind of yeah I don't know it was good there's a theme of of how a lot of those songs have queer roots what was your first discovery there so that was I think um I think Shovel Dance Collective was that was something that they they focused on definitely um we I think what was interesting when we were kind of curating the everyone for the film was that everyone we kind of wanted to have uh four groups that had come approached folk music from completely different places um and so we have got we've got Caroline in it as well who kind of um they started off in an Appalachian band when they were teenagers or whatever that's got kind of the first it's how they met and and now they obviously have gone from those folk roots into something you know um much different so that was kind of about how i guess how that had influenced what they do now how folk had influenced what they do now then there was um there's us for example where it was kind of we were playing it our we we had formed a folk club and that was we all our group was kind of formed of people that came out on a friday night you know when pubs weren't open um and it was much more of a communal thing um that's really nice and then you've got shovel dance where it's kind of as you say it's um uh they kind of dig for sort of queer narratives and stuff in in folk songs um yeah so all everyone's sort of from different places which is what made it interesting i think And the film, well, by the time this comes out, the film was premiered at South By. How did that come about? And was that like, a, did that feel like a success being able to premiere it as, with somewhere with such, you know, clout and history? And yeah, I mean, it was. It's all thanks to British Underground, really. Uh, Crispin and Naomi there, who they they kind of approached us around the similar time that Jeff sort of called us to do this Shirley thing. Um, I think. Yeah, they they had heard about they before songs without authors came out. There was another compilation called Our Singing Tradition, which was all recorded on phones. It was all a cappella, um, and they'd heard that and said, "Do you?" They already had the date in the diary booked. The they'd hired Real World Studios <laughs> and said, "Do you want to come make a documentary? Here? Pick a few bands um, to come and feature in it." Um, so it was all very. Yeah, it was. It's. I mean, he before we'd even met, he kind of asked if we wanted to do that. Um, so it all happened quite quickly, and um, we filmed it last August. Um, but yeah, they the original plan was to kind of have it have it premiered um, at another festival in the states when COVID restrictions and everything was still in place. But um, we held off on that and. Yeah, they basically they asked us they asked if we wanted to us and Shovel Dance wanted to come out to South and we'd premiere it there instead. So yeah, well thanks to them really. Have you seen the final cut or are you are you waiting? No, I've seen yeah, I've seen it. Um, we had had a little private viewing at um, the, uh, in somewhere in the Curzon in Holborn a few months ago, uh, where it was kind of everyone involved and some press and stuff came. Mm. Um, but there's. I mean, there's a few, I think there's a few different cuts, you know, that they do depending on, because I know that the South by there's like a certain type, it's got to be a certain length or whatever. Um, and, or for this particular, you know, show, they wanted to make it a certain length, um, not, you know, bore everyone with an hour and a half of people talking about <laughs> <laughs> folk songs. But no, so I think there's a, maybe a, a slightly abridged version for South by. Uh, there's one cut which has... Shirley Collins doing some narration as well, Amazing. which I haven't actually seen. Um, but it's nice. It's it feels um, it feels like we're kind of ready to make another one, you know, <laughs> because it was felt it's that it feels like quite a long time ago now that we actually filmed it, and we were so sort of uh, it was so we were so new. We'd done a few gigs, you know, and we were in real world filming it, so. But it's a nice, it's a nice sort of documentation of, of where we were at that stage after coming out of the pandemic and having, you know, run this folk club for like four or five months or whatever. Brilliant, yeah. I mean, it's and that's what it is. It's a documentation. It, is is it? It's. I mean, I kind of wondered, having not seen it, I wondered if it would almost be a, 
you know, like an alternative format of of the record of of the group. It's the two. The, it's funny the boards. The two boards like there's kind of two arms to boards like that. I mean, I guess there's maybe more potentially, arguably more. But um, <clears throat> in terms of the music side of things, there's um, there's the all the songs about author stuff, which is all was all sort of done remotely because of because of restrictions and lockdown and whatever. And then the folk club um, stuff, in, in fact, was not centered around. It was people that were involved in in the compilation, but. Um, but actually kind of had no association in terms of how it was um how it started like it was more of a casual thing there were people that came that were involved in the compilation there were people that came that weren't it wasn't um it wasn't like we did the compilation and we're like right let's play these songs it was actually um we kind of it was more of a <clears throat> there was no one sort of leading it necessarily mm. um and we take it in turns to choose the songs or whatever. So in in fact, in the, in the documentary, we don't play any of the songs that are on the, on the compilation. It has this, they were all kind of formed through being in a room together. Whereas the compilation is, it's like back and forth on laptops. So they're two very different things. Do you think that's a, a way to be a group in, in this time and not such a rigid structure, having something a bit more fluid and a bit more having a few more floating points. Do you think that's something that keeps music being exciting, you know, keeps, keeps records having a, you know, a bit of spice, a bit of something new? Yeah, certainly for us, it was, it was really refreshing having done being in a studio with maybe like a few of us at a time, um, multi-tracking everything and <clears throat> overdubbing it's really nice to actually suddenly be in a room with everyone and playing song playing these songs for the first time you know because we'd none of us had we kind of learned i kind of learned how to play folk for the purpose of the compilation <laughs> um so yeah there was a kind of a lot of learning to do in terms of um being more of a yeah a band i guess not that we were not that we were kind of trying to form a band at the time but brilliant <clears throat> wicked well yeah thanks so much for, for for giving me all that that's such a wonderful story and no oh, thank you for having me yeah story made of stories yeah <laughs> there's kind of no end to it is, is that I know, how you yeah. feel i think so yeah maybe yeah <laughs> i need to go browse. get my ticket to kite festival you do, yeah, yeah. Nice one. Well, let's see you soon then, yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks, Giles. Catch you soon. I've been working all day, got me mate on the side. Running around like a blue ass fly. I've been working, yeah, I've been working all day, got me mate. Every blinking minute, I've been on the go. Up and down the ladder, like a business they'll bow. I've been working, yeah, I've been working all day, got me mate. This is a Mighty Moon Media podcast. 